hope that traffic was uh, great when you were on the way here. Uh, I would like to firstly thank the U.S. Embassy for facilitating and assisting us for the conduct of this public lecture series. Um, I firstly use this opportunity to kindly introduce myself. My name is Tafan Samudra. I am one of the researchers at the ASEAN Studies Program at the Hebrew Center. And we are immensely honored to be joined by uh, Mr. Greg Pauling uh, uh, on my left, uh, who is the director at the Asia Maritime Transparency, in Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies at the United States. Thank you for coming here. Bye, Greg. Uh, as you can see on our screen, the, the topic of our lecture today is to the charting the uncharted ocean navigating the future of maritime security uh, in the South China Sea. Um, for those who may not know, uh, Mr. Greg just recently published his book uh, on dangerous ground, congratulations on uh, the uh, publication. Um, the objectives of our discussion today, uh, among others, to discuss the recent developments in the South China Sea dispute and its impacts on peace, uh, security, and stability of the Indo-Pacific region, and as well as to assess the United States efforts in maintaining peace in the South China Sea through Quad and Office, and as well as to analyze the outlook of the negotiation of the COC in the near future. But before we begin, I would like to also explain to you the format of our public lecture series uh, this time around. So this discussion will be separated into two sessions. So the first session will be a presentation from Mr. Greg uh, with a 15 and 20 minutes allocated time, and then followed by the Q&A session at the end, uh, both from uh, the attendees uh, in person and online. Uh, we can see a webcam in front of us, so for audience online, uh, please feel free to uh, drop in your questions, uh, just state your name and institution and I will read them out loud later on at our uh, q session. So I guess uh, without further ado, I believe a lot of us both online and in person are immense, uh, impatiently waiting for this discussion to commence. So I would like to invite Patrick to take the floor, please, Patrick. Oh, well, uh, thank you so much and thank you to the DD Center for welcoming me here. It's been four years since I've been able to visit Indonesia. Um, I think we're all tired of being cooped up in this COVID. So I'm so thrilled to be back in Jakarta. And thank you to the U.S. Embassy for helping to arrange this. Um, my, my lecture today is going to revolve around the public book, but I want to be clear that we should go well beyond this and have you talk about anything you want uh, when we get to Q&A. The reason that I wrote this book, which is published last month in the U.S., should be available in Indonesia in the next month or two, fingers crossed, is that uh, there's been a lot of stories written the last couple of years in the newspapers about whether or not the South China Sea has been lost, whatever that means, lost in the US, lost in the Philippines or Vietnam. And about, at least in the United States, policymakers have not done a very good job of explaining what that means. What does the US care about in the South China Sea? What do our allies care about? And therefore, what do we have to lose? The reason that I titled it America's Century in South China Sea is because that's how long the United States has been an active participant in the dispute. The picture on the cover is of the USS Olympia sailing across the South China Sea from Hong Kong to Manila Bay to defeat the Spanish fleet in the Battle of 1898. The United States entered the South China Sea as the colonial power in the Philippines, even though Washington does not like to remember that we were a colonial power in the Philippines. And then we stayed in the South China originally at least, because of the alliance with the as well as the alliance of the Republic of China Vietnam. So throughout the century, what kept the U.S. in the South? The argument I'm making in the book, based on all the state department tables, the government documents that they declassified, that two things we came back to over and over again. One, <coughs> alliance principles. The United States, while it maintained careful neutrality, and still does, on the sovereignty question, could not accept the risk of violence because it had alliance commitments to the Philippines, as well as South Vietnam and the Republic of China. And two, this concern about 
freedom of speech. The United States was born as a maritime trade union, much as in the usual. The United States is deeply invested in the idea of the ocean as a global maritime commerce. Uh, it was the first expeditionary, expeditionary military operation by the United States were the two Barbary Wars in which President Jefferson sent the new U.S. Navy to stop piracy against U.S. mariners off the Barbary Coast. It's why we fought a second war against Britain in 1812. So this idea of international maritime law is deeply held and one of the most consistent strings in U.S. foreign policy for centuries. It plays out in South Africa just like it does globally. Now, with that out of the way, let's frame the debate quickly and then I want to move through the history to get to the real meat. And I, I want to be clear, um, this book is a American history, so a lot of it focuses on U.S. history. But I'm going to pander and try to bring out every time an Indonesia pops up in the narrative uh, moving as we walk through. <coughs> so in the South China Sea, we're talking about two different kinds. The older dispute is over sovereignty, uh, over who owns or who, who has sovereignty over the Stratley Islands, the Paracel Islands, Krasa Greece, and Scarborough Shoal. And then the second dispute is the newer one over maritime which today we, we most often think of as the 9 dash line. Now the 9 dash line that China has dates to the 1930s, but for most of the 20th century, the line only meant that China was claiming the island of China. It wasn't until the 1990s really that the line became some kind of boundary in which China began to claim its right. And that's when this issue of freedom of speech came into effect. Which means when you frame out the dispute, we're really first decade of the 20th century, all the way up until the 1990s, the dispute was just about the line of state even the Filipino community. Suddenly from the 1990s until today, the dispute is still about that, but it's also about the law, about maritime law and freedom of speech. Now, how do we, we get to this dispute? Well, the first time anybody claimed any island to the South China Sea were the Vietnamese. 1816, the Vietnamese emperors are long, and the Paracel Islands. But then that largely gets forgotten, particularly after the French Navy. In 1909 is the first modern claim. Uh, the Republic of China annexes the Paracel Islands in 1909. The French also make claims to the Paracel Islands in the 1920s. And the Japanese decide to begin setting up shop with the commercial in 1920. It doesn't move south into the Spratly Islands which is the heart of the dispute today until the 1930s. In 1933, France issued the first modern claim to Spratly Island. They claimed these seven islands. As a result of this French claim, China said nothing. The Republic of China even studied the issue and decided that it had no claim to Spratly Island. The southernmost point of Chinese territory was Paracel. And this 1933 claim led to the first uh, Philippine expression of by 1937, the Filipinos were telling the Americans, the Commonwealth government of the Philippines at the time, was telling the Americans that they would claim the Spratly as a All of that became somewhat academic when the Japanese invaded in 1938-39. Uh, Japan, in 1938, set up two naval bases on Woody Island and Lincoln Island in the Paracel. The French set up their own naval base over in Papua and tried to stare at that. By 1939, the Japanese are in total control. They annex all of the islands. Decades. 
1947, the Republic of China briefly occupied two of the islands, Woody Island and Iguala, and the French set up shop on the five largest of the islands in the western half of Africa. When the Republic of Vietnam became independent, it uh, inherited those outposts and it would maintain them until 1974. The Republic of China would have to leave the islands that it occupied in 1951 when it lost the Chinese Civil War. And in 1955, the People's Republic of China would quietly occupy Woody Island. And that is the only thing the People's Republic of China occupied in the South China Sea for 20 years. Down in the Spratlys, nobody occupied anything after the nationalist forces left in 51. Until 1956, when a Philippine adventurer named, named Tomas Roma famously went out and claimed all of what he called freedom land, which was this box, on behalf of the Philippine government. The Philippine government rejected Cuomo's claim. President Maksaisai at the time said that Cuomo was crazy, but the fallout had already begun. The Republic of China was angry, so it came back and reoccupied Iguala, and the Republic of Vietnam in the south began to patrol, the naval patrol, around the islands for the first time. If we fast forward to the late 1960s and early 1970s, things really heat up when oil and gas is expected to exist in the islands. So in 1968, a UN uh, report comes out that says that there is likely oil and gas under the South China Sea. Okay. So anyway, as a result of the suspicion about oil and gas, the Philippines and Vietnam both occupy some of the islands. Now to be clear, this is not the start of their claim. China insists that this is when Philippine and Vietnamese claims begin. That is not true. Philippine and Vietnamese claims existed before World War II, but they chose not to occupy the islands at that time. They waited until uh, 1970, 1971 to finally set up their base. Now, if you're the U.S., what do you see when you look at this? All three of these countries are U.S. treaty allies. In 1973, all three of them have a legal commitment for mutual defense from the United States. So the largest U.S. concern remains keeping them from fighting each other. Uh, while this is happening, we also have the seeds of the future maritime dispute being uh, planted. So maritime law is evolving while these disputes are happening. In 1958, the first UN conference in the law of Vietnam, and that conference had decided to codify the idea of the territorial sea and the continental shelf. So suddenly there is this thing called the continental shelf. Uh, we don't know how long it is yet, but we know that it exists and that you can claim oil and gas on it. In 1957, the year before the conference, you also had the first claim to archipelagic waters, archipelagic baselines, made by Indonesian Prime Minister Juanda Kartuligaya, who would continue to push this idea of archipelagic baselines throughout the next two UN conferences. The third UN conference in the Wall of the Sea meets throughout the 1970s, and by the end of the 1970s, everybody knows what the final regime is going to look like. It's going to include the kind of shell, and it's going to include a new thing called the exclusive. So throughout the 1970s, you start to get this codification of um, Malaysia and Indonesia negotiate their kind of shelf. In 1979, Indonesia puts out its first oil and gas uh, bid in the southern part of the South China Sea, which are taken by American companies um, who end up not finding anything. And you have the Filipinos and the Vietnamese beginning to put out oil and gas exploration. Things radically changed in the latter half of the 1970s, though. In 1974, China and things to really scare the Philippines. So if you're in the Philippines, you just watch China launch an invasion in the Paracels. We just watched the North Vietnamese take over all the South Vietnamese outposts. And you know that the Americans are going to abrogate their treaty with Taiwan soon, with the Republic of China. They've been telegraphing that for years. That'll happen in 1979. So the Philippines finally begins to ask the Americans explicitly, 
does our mutual defense treaty cover an attack in the South China Sea? That's the first time the Philippines has asked, and by 1979, the U.S. government says yes. Sends a letter from Secretary of State to Dr. Japan clarifying that an attack does not need to happen in the territory of the Philippines for the U.S. Philippine mutual defense treaty to, to uh, apply. This is particularly important because the Filipinos have begun to drill for oil and gas. 1976, 1977, 1978, and they're worried that China or Vietnam, now the unified SR. China invades Vietnam, everybody forgets about the South China Sea. Until 1987 and 1988, when China begins to move into the Spratly Islands. China begins moving to the Spratly Islands because China had spent all of the 1980s building up its naval forces. By 1988, for the first time in its history, the People's Republic of China has a navy that can actually get to the Spratly Islands, and a coast guard, and a surveillance fleet that can do that. So they go down, they set up their first outpost on Fiery Cross Reef. The Vietnam responds by trying to block China. So they play this game of checkers throughout the first few months of 1988, in which China occupies Thailand, Vietnam occupies Thailand, on and on until they both get to Johnson Reef on the same day. The Vietnamese get on the reef first, China gets there a couple hours later, sinks the Vietnamese boat on the sea, and then kills all 66 Vietnamese Marines who are up on the reef. After that, Vietnam can't do anything about the subsequent Chinese occupation, and China takes four more hours, so that by the end of the year, or the middle of the year 1988, it has six bases in the Spratly Now this, marks a turning point, the same modernization campaign that allowed China to go down and claim some of the strategies for the first time, also led China, and China's Navy in particular, to begin promoting this idea that China should be claiming all resources in the South China Sea. This is where what eventually became China's historic rights claim started, this idea about uh, defending national rights in the South China Sea. In 1985, for the first time, China had began to subsidize its fishing fleet. So in 1985, the first Chinese boats show up in the Spratly Islands for the first time since the World War II. In 1991, China begins to explicitly subsidize fishermen to fish in the Indonesian exclusive economic zone for the first time, in what China will come to call the Southwest Fishing Ground. In 1994, China releases a map of fishing grounds that it claims that clearly follow the nine dash line. And that map is what leads the Indonesian government in 1995 for the first time to admit that China is claiming part of the Indonesian Sea. That, as far as I can tell, 1995 was the first time the Indonesian government ever admitted that it was in a maritime dispute with China. Of course, it would spend the next 25 years trying to be coy about whether or not that was really true. China also began to contest all oil and gas rights in the South China Sea. In 1992, it put out bidding for Wanan Bay, a block 800 miles south of China, way beyond what it could claim from any of the Spratly Islands. This is that Vanguard Bank where the Vietnamese were drilling at that time. In 1996, China claimed straight base lines around the Paracels and said that no foreign vessels or aircraft could go through them, which is a clear violation of the Archipelagic Base Lines rule that Juan de Carlo Jaya held right. Um, and by 1998, China has finally explicitly claimed historic rights. China's uh, exclusive economic zone law, 1998, said that China claims territorial sea, EEZ, Kansas Belt, and historic rights. So it's no surprise that at the same time, really 1995 is when things start to come to a head, everybody in Alaska is getting worried, Indonesia is worried, and the U.S. State Department for the very first time says that South China Sea is a national interest of the United States. The U.S. cares both about peaceful resolution of disputes, which it always had, and freedom of navigation. 1995 was the first time the U.S. State Department expressed public concern that China will begin to restrict foreign freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. As a result of all of this activity that China is undertaking in the 1980s and 90s, that's clearly treating the Nine Dash Line as some kind of boundary. I'm going to skip the ASEAN-EOC negotiations. 
we have to talk about it later, but <laughs> all of this becomes a very, very explicit in 2009. You may know the story. Malaysia and Vietnam have to submit their kind of shelf claims as part of a uh, deadline set by the UN. And China responds by issuing a note for a bottle to the UN, information on the limits of the kind of shelf, that just it says it objects to what they just did. And then it includes an, a map of the nine dash line and says China claims rights in this line. It was the first time that China had been explicit that the nine dash line was the boundary within which it was claiming stored rights. One year later, Indonesia responded with a very detailed note for bottle attacking China's legal rationale point by point and rejecting the nine dash line. But this began this really no verbal war that takes place in 2009 to 2011 begins the decade plus now of escalation that we're still tracking, in which China makes clear that it's claiming more and more and more legal rights within the nine dash line, and other countries, including the US, are pushing back. In 2012, China seized Barbara Schultz in the Philippines. The Philippines responded in 2013 by launching the arbitration case, which China would eventually lose. China responded to that in December 2013 by beginning its island building campaign. From the end of 2013 until the middle of 2016, China dumped 3,200 acres of new sand in the Spratly Islands, creating three air and naval bases. Fire Crawl Three, Subi Reef, and this one, the biggest. Now, to make a point about the environmental destruction, to create that 3,200 acres of land, China dug up 15,000 acres of coal. China allowed its clam digging boat to destroy another 25,000 acres, which means that in about three years, China intentionally destroyed 40,000 acres of coral reef in the world's most productive fishing grounds. In 2016, the arbitral award came down, the Philippines won on 14 out of those 15 points that they raised, uh, including the environmental damage that China was accused of doing. The nine dash line was rejected. The court ruled that none of the islands in the Spratly qualify as fully entitled to an EPA continental shelf under envelope. They essentially limited the dispute to just the bubbles around the islands, those islands are high tide. Everything outside of those bubbles is not subject to a valid Chinese claim, which means that this is the full extent currently of the legal dispute over continental shells and EEC, or EEC continental shells, within the South China Sea. Now, the problem with all of this, and why I have 10 seconds, is that China, of course, continues to reject the rule. In 2016, we have the infamous cases, three cases of Bakama trying to arrest Chinese fishermen operating illegally in uh, the North China Sea. One of which involved a Chinese Coast Guard boat entering Indonesia territorial waters and ramming the vessel to prevent Bakama from getting the back in the Um And then just last year, we had the first ever Chinese attempt to block oil and gas exploration in the Indonesian GP, the tuna block, which is the exact same thing that China has done to every new oil and gas project in Malaysia, Vietnamese, and Philippine waters for at least four years. Which means Indonesia is now receiving the exact same kind of harassment that its neighbors in the north have been receiving for quite a while. I'm going to wrap there because we've got plenty of time for questions and answers, but I hope you ask me what we're supposed to do about all this. <laughs> or you can read the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rick, for the very interesting uh, presentation on South China Sea. And I think it is, it is worth to note that. Uh, the way you emphasize the historical background of uh, the dispute is uh, very important uh, considering now uh, we, we know that there are certain terms that just put out in the 1970s such as the continental, continental shelf and so on and so forth that have been used in the um, COC negotiation as well. Uh, just to remind the audience on uh, online uh, uh, platform in YouTube, um, the you can drop in your questions and, and state your name and institution, and I will read them out uh, in the Q and A session, which is uh, um, now. So, just to kickstart the discussion, if I may, uh, but with, um, I know that you've been uh, given, um, if I may say, it's like the storytelling, the historical backgrounds of the South China Sea and 
and as I said, that, as I said is very important. But um, to what extent does the historical background plays a, a role in, in determining the future of the maritime security, especially in the South China Sea? Uh, please, Robert. Well, because the reason so much, uh, Patrick, for the um, interesting answer. If uh, any of the uh, in-person attendees would like to just feel free to uh, raise hands and ask questions. Okay, if not, then I have, I have more questions if I may. Uh, since you skipped the, the COC part, uh, uh, now that we've already got the historical background uh, addressed, I would like to know, in your opinion, uh, since so far this SDNT um, um, uh, negotiation has been always between ASEAN and China, but then um, it's it is clear that within uh, the area that there there has been many other international players as well, uh, and and I I know it. Many scholars believe that within the COC should be a dispute mechanism. Should the dispute mechanism, um, well, put in place and will be will be probably um, be implemented between ASEAN and China? But how about the other international players within the region? Do you think there should be a, a specific um, a dispute mechanism or clause that also um, kind of concern or or or, or Put out uh, to the relevant international players in the region. Yes. <laughs> so, so the, the, the book progresses sequentially, and the chapter subtitled 1990 2008 is titled Diplomacy Disciplines. And that is because this is the era where ASEAN really took a shot at trying to manage the South China Sea. And to be blunt, it failed. Not by any fault of ASEAN, but because China was unwilling to meet it halfway. The discussions that we're having, ASEAN is having today about the code of conduct, are the exact same discussions ASEAN had in 1990. And China likes it that way. So the reason I start that in 1990 is because in 1990, Indonesia launched 
the first meeting of, of what became the workshop series on managing conflict in the South China Sea, which was led by Ambassador Hashim Jalal, who helped negotiate on close, and in 1995 became the first president of the United States Seabed Authority. About, other than Tommy So, probably the most prominent maritime lawyer in South Asia. And that, those meetings met consistently for 18 years, and they still meet today in a very reduced form. In 18 years, there was not a single practical cooperative mechanism that was derived from those workshops. There were tons of papers written every year on things that should be done, but consistently China refused to actually follow through. The same happened in the conduct negotiations. Uh, after China had taken Mr. Jeffries and done the claims historic rights, ASEAN in 1995 endorsed the idea of the Code of Conduct. And then in 1998, ASEAN passed Manila to write the first draft on behalf of the organization. That draft was taken to China, and China came back with a draft, its own draft, that looks almost identical to what China inserted into the single draft negotiating text four years ago. It demanded an end to all foreign military exercises in the South China Sea South Mission, which was essentially a call to end the US war, and to kick the Americans out of Singapore. It demanded no third party to be allowed to engage in oil and gas exploration, which would have meant that nobody could engage in oil and gas exploration at all because Sino at the time wasn't legal. Um, it had no dispute settlement mechanism, it wasn't legally binding, it refused to include the Paracel Islands, all of the things that are still being debated. And the, the negotiations got so frustrating that ASEAN had to accept. Line to implement the DOC, which was just China's way of stalling for time. And then things went completely on hiatus until 2017, when suddenly Foreign Minister Wang Yi says, you know what, we should restart these code of conduct talks, and we should finish them in three years. Why did Wang Yi come up with this idea in 2017? Because it was the best way to deflect criticism from the arbitral war. China had just lost the arbitration, and the Duterte government gave him the perfect chance to wiggle out by saying that they wanted to shelve the dispute and pursue its own development. And China seized that opportunity. And then we get a single draft negotiating text to make some progress. So, do I think there should be a dispute settlement mechanism in the COC? Sure. Do I think there will be one? No, because there hasn't been for the last 25 years. China has no interest in negotiating a real code of conduct with Asia. If it did, it would have done so at any point in the last quarter century. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, uh, we have a question here from um, our online audience. This is from Muhammad Arif uh, from the University of Indonesia. What is the prospect of China officially enforcing archipelagic baselines around the Sprout Lakes? 100%. It's a matter of when, not if. China has consistently said that it claims great baselines around strategies and it will tell us when, when it gets around to it. In fact, China's territorial sea law of 1992 says that China measures its maritime zone from all islands and it specifically mentions strategies and the Paracel from straight baselines. When China declared the straight baselines around the Paracel Islands in 1996, it said, at a note at the bottom, Baselines around Spratlys will follow, as it did around um, Dongsha, Dongsha, the controversial Pratas, and the, the Diaoyu Islands. It issued the Diaoyu Islands based on 2013. If you look at the limits in the sea study that the U.S. State Department released last year, the entire focus is on this question about baselines. Because Chinese lawyers, state-linked lawyers, have spent most of the time since 2016 trying to reframe China's claim to de-emphasize the 9 f line because the 9 f line has been so thoroughly discredited. Instead, they want to focus on this idea of what they call the four Sha, the four island group, which we've known about for decades, and the idea of offshore archipelagos within those islands. Meaning, offshore archipelagos is very common. Unclose specifies, again, as Indonesia and the Philippines Consistent. This was the Indonesian demand in on this. The one issue on this Indonesia refused to buy demanded that archipelagic states be given a 
special right under our court to claim our flat based on. That right is denied to continental states who happen to have our development. So the U.S. does not claim baselines around Hawaii. We do not claim baselines around Guam or the Marianas or the U.S. Virgin Islands. Same as in France, Britain, and India. China wants to claim archipelagic baselines, but it's not an archipelagic power. And what makes this even more absurd is that there is a specific ratio baked into UNCLOS that says archipelagic countries, when claiming archipelagic baselines, may not exceed a ratio of 9 to 1 for the water to land encompassed in those baselines. And what this is meant to do is prevent very tiny archipelagos in the Pacific Ocean from, claim, from encompassing huge expanses of water and saying that they're internal. 9 to 1 is the magic ratio. The ratio that China encompassed within the Paracels is over 1,000 to 1. The ratio it would cover in the Spratlys is probably closer to 10,000 to 1, depending on where it puts the baseline. China didn't have a maid, when China wasn't a maritime power. 
what it changed is that by the 1990s, China viewed itself as a great power. The rules no longer worked, right? The rules weren't benefiting China, they were constraining China. And so the rules should change, not China. That is the fundamental problem here, not only with China's violations of unquote, but with China's violations of international rules and norms in general. China does not view international law as binding upon all states equally. China views international law as a tool of the powerful to be imposed on the weak. Thank you. Um, we have another question before we move on to also the question from the in-person attendees. Uh, <clears throat> will China take military action in the South China Sea? like this in the future when the U.S. or Quad or other anti-China alliance acts against China's interests in the South China Sea? Two different questions, aren't they? Will China take military action and is the Quad an anti-China alliance? <laughs> um, China reserves the right to use military force in the South China Sea. That's pretty explicit in all Chinese government statements and documents. China reserves the right to defend what it believes are its rights by whatever means necessary. However, China would really rather not do that. You know, when you look at, at Beijing's behavior, particularly the last decade, it is focused very much on using non-military means of coercion, Coast Guard pressure, the maritime militia funded by the state, illegal survey methods owned by the state, all to make it increasingly expensive and dangerous for civilians to operate. So today, it is almost impossible. In fact, I'll take that back. It is impossible to find a foreign company who will invest in an oil and gas block industry as well. The only two companies currently drilling new blocks in the South China Sea are Petronas, the state-owned company in Malaysia, and Zerubbezhna, the state-owned company of Russia. Drilling the tunnel. That's it. You can't get commercial enterprise to do it because China's made it too dangerous. The same is true for fishermen, the same is true of law enforcement, the same is increasingly true of Philippine attempts to keep their own soldiers resupply with food and water. China doesn't want to use this. China wants to make it so hard, so dangerous to operate that everybody else will just agree the fight's already over, that there's no fight to be had. And this puts the United States and its allies in a very difficult position. You'll have the Philippines say, do something about these maritime militia. And the U.S. will say, what do you want us to do about it? Well, Obama will say, no, no, not that. Well, China knows where the threat Meanwhile, it can undermine the credibility of the United States because if we get to a point where the only people who can safely sail the South China Sea are the U.S. Navy, then aren't Southeast Asian partners going to look around and say, what the heck did we support the U.S. presence for the last seven years for if it only helps the Americans? I will defer on the quad question for now. I will say um, I don't think quad is an anti-China alliance, although I do think the thing that brings the quad together is all of their shared fears. Apologies that we have to pass on this mic because this one doesn't work. But any questions? Yes, please. Um, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Hera. I am also one of the researchers at the Habibi Center. So um, I am curious about is um, as we know that China has been transforming to be one of the biggest global economic power in the world. So how do you see the relationship between China economic power to the, um, uh, their influence or movement towards the South China Sea? Thank you. China 
is economic power, particularly here in the region, is weaponized, not just on the South China Sea, but on pretty much all Central Asia, whether it's about Taiwan, um, East China Sea, issues in Ladakh on the Indian border, human rights concerns in Xinjiang. Why don't Asian states speak up about these and other issues? Because of the fear of Chinese economic retaliation. And those fears are not misplaced. If Indonesia, which has never publicly endorsed the 2015 award, came out tomorrow and said it endorses the award, I promise that suddenly Indonesian produce wouldn't be able to get into China because of sudden phytosanitary concerns. I promise that major Chinese investments would suddenly be put on hold or canceled altogether. This is what happened to the Koreans when they brought in the FAD missile system, you know, both that it was banned from operating. It's what happened to the Filipinos when they launched the arbitration war. It's what happened to the Australians when they spoke up on Xinjiang and COVID. China does weaponize economic interdependence in a way that no other state has before. Kind of like, let's compare yeah, all great powers try to find ways to use their power to shape the system, to convince others to get along with what they want. The Americans did it by building a system of rules and norms. And the nice thing about that is that for the most part, people decided that oh, Americans are arrogant, frustrating, but these rules actually do work for most of most of the time. One of those rules and norms, that system, was this, this system of globalized economics. Right? Draw down barriers, reduce consumer prices for all of us, until China weaponized the system. I don't have good answers to this, but it's clearly put into stark contrast for the first time the question of whether or not, well, where is the point at which other states are willing to risk economic benefit in order to stand up for issues of international law and norms that don't directly and that's the real key, right? The Philippines or Vietnam stand up because it's directly hitting them in the rest of the world. The doesn't, because it doesn't directly affect them. Which also, I guess, answers our earlier sort of comment question. Why will Laos and Cambodia never endorse an actual code of conduct? Because the South Korean doesn't impact them directly, and they're not willing to forego Chinese economic investment on behalf of some vague idea about international law. Right. Uh, I think we had a question. Follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greg. Uh, my question is: Is the rise of China economically and militarily that make the problem of so China Sea right now? Is all of U.S. foreign policy after Cold War, because U.S. is too much focused on Middle East. So right now, U.S. came to the Pacific with Quad and August. You can die in there. Thank you. It's a, it's a really interesting question. I do address this a little bit in the book, and it's, it's been a hotly debated point within Washington. How much? Does China's perception, right or wrong, of American decline influence China's actions? So my take is that we would have gotten here regardless. If China has been moving in this direction, they claim the historic rights for at least 30 years. Coercion and 
why when it's not only in South Asia, but also in East Asia, that China begins to throw its weight around, believing that it won't get pushed back from a weakened and distracted America. I would say the other thing that accelerated this, of course, was Xi Jinping's elevation of power. So you, when you look at the graphs, you say that the frequency of Chinese small exports of running for Vietnam and, and the Philippines, it started to increase in about 2009. It really kicked off in 2013. Because Xi Jinping put the South China Sea at the heart of his ideology. His first big speech on the China Sea was in, uh, in May of 2013, and he made maritime rights a fundamental component of that. So you've got leader level pushing on the South China Sea in a way you hadn't had before under Hu Jintao or Zhang Zemin. Um, and of course, Xi Jinping is much more risk tolerant. He is willing to do things that Hu Jintao considered too dangerous. Thank you so much. But what, uh, we have another question that is from um, our online audience. Um, from Muhammad Arif, who asked the, the first question, I believe, uh, from the University of Indonesia. The fact that China adopted more unclosed friendly narrative post-2016, does it say anything about the limits in China's challenge to the existing rules? There's a, there's a positive and a negative here. Let's start with the negative. The negative is what, what commonly is called lawfare. Right? China has invested an enormous amount of money, money by the standards of scholarships in building up its capacity on maritime law. So there was this interesting journal article just a couple of years ago, I believe by a Vietnamese scholar, showing the amount of money that state scholarships were going to in different law fields in China and the explosion in maritime law scholarships after about 2012. China wants to weaponize the narrative of law because China knows that there aren't that many maritime lawyers out there who understand uncles. If it can frame its claims in a way that sounds reasonable, that sounds legal, then it plants just enough doubt that it can get around it. Right? And we don't just see this from the average citizen or from the press, we see it from leaders. Most presidents and prime ministers are not maritime lawyers. And so they will act like Chinese language about joint development, about historic rights is somehow reasonable. It sounds reasonable. It sounds far better than the nine back line, which is clearly illegal. So much of this is a battle about narrative. It's not just about being right or wrong. It's about being able to convince other people that they're right. And China's done a very good job of weaponizing the language of international law to make it harder and harder for particularly the Philippines garner international support for its position. The positive side is that the fact that China even bothers to do that shows how much China does care about its image. So people will often, when I do these speeches, do these lectures, and I talk about all the things we should do to try to convince Beijing to compromise, inevitably somebody in the audience will stand up and say, China never compromised. China doesn't care about any of this. And I would argue, then why is China go to so much trouble to try to fool us? If China didn't care, it would just take whatever it wanted and tell us all to go jump in a lake. China views itself as a global leader. That makes China different than, say, a North Korea or even a Russia, which only sees itself now as a regional leader. It means that if we can impose enough cost of the international community, China may seek compromise because it doesn't want its regional behavior to undermine its global role of leadership. Oh. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Um, any of you have? Julia, yeah. please, with Julia. Yeah. Uh, power. You mentioned that the, the, the control, the, the narrative, 
I'm thinking like actually but the problem here the problem here is about US and China trying to exercise their global jurisdiction of testing or countries and then you know we are live or not doing this. Thank you. So I don't think we have to get your opinion about that. Undoubtedly, the South China Sea has become one from just one, but a very, very important one in a battle over competing visions for global order. Um, now, for Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, it's also a battle for fishing rights, and oil and gas, and sovereignty. In the U.S., aside from the Philippine Land Amendment, this is mostly about the broader question of are there rules that move the rules market? Now, it is not as if China has a competing set of rules, though, right? China doesn't have a coherent, unclosed 2.0 of this thing that no, no, the system of China proposes is the idea that there is no such thing as international rules that apply to all things. Because there is no such thing as co-equal states. You know, the, what's the, the most famous line that, that Chinese government probably want back is Jan Ditcher at the 2010 Asian Regional Forum when he was confronted by all the Afghan foreign ministers about South China Sea, stormed out, came back in, and yelled at George Hill from Singapore in the face, some countries are big countries and some countries are small countries. So that's just the way it is. What China wants is for international law to keep applying externally, outside the region. Because that law actually works. China did very well in the current system of international law. But China wants that law to stop at the borders of the US. China wants the a regime in which China sets all rules and no rule by China. The U.S. and, and I want to be here and say when we say the U.S., we are using a shorthand for most of the United States. Right? I mean, Uncle is not written by the United States because that U.S. hates them. Uncle is because why it didn't ultimately ratify the treaty. But when we talk about the rules of the order, we're talking about the system that not just the U.S. and Europe, but ultimately most of the and Latin America, and Africa, and the Middle East, China, in which smaller states at least have some reprieve from the power of large states, in which great power competition is mitigated, is buffered by rules of one state. For that system to survive, it must apply universally. Of course, great powers will always seek to bend the rules. That's what great powers do. The U.S. is all the world there's a difference between bending and breaking. China would ignore the rule of law. I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, I do think there is a more systemic competition. And it's really a question of whether or not there is a system. Mm. Um, maybe another question from the others, please. My name is Talon from FPCI. Um, I have two questions. Uh, so the first question is uh, related to the speaker's visit to Taipei. I just want to know your um, insights. What would be the process thinking behind the visit from Washington point of view in the front? So that's the first question. And the second question would be, um, I just want to know Washington would um, respond or thinking if China start endorsing the term of Indo Pacific. Um, Wang Yi has mentioned it, endorsing in this recent speech on Asset Secretary. And my president managed a meeting with uh, President Xi, joint community was endorsing the Asset of Indo Pacific. So those are the things. I think this is probably part of the conversation where. Here, let me remind everybody that I did not speak for the U.S. government <laughs> and is not, in fact, a member of the U.S. government. Um, so I think the consensus in most of the region, and probably among most experts in Washington, was that Speaker Pelosi's visit was um, legal and fine but also unnecessarily escalated, particularly at a, at a sensitive time for China to give up their phone. So, if you ask me, before her visit, should 
these are below you go in Taiwan right now. I probably say that all day. That said, and, and, and by the way, clearly that was the opinion of President Biden and the US military. And it's publicly said they thought this was a bad idea. But they don't get to control it. You know, if the US system is built on two or three co equal branches of government, there's nothing the president can do to stop the future of the house from flying anywhere in the world on US military ships. That's what he wants to do. Um, once China had reacted the way it did, with over threat, then it became impossible for the future not to be And it became impossible for the U.S. government not to support the regime. And for most of the region, it became vital that they did. So I spent last week in Vietnam. I didn't hear a single voice saying that Pete Pelosi can't do this. Every single voice I heard probably here in privately was, now she has to do it. I mean, it, it, yes, it was a bad idea, but once China said she couldn't do it, it would have been damaging to U.S. credibility and to regional security for her not to be to back down to China again. Because China, to simplify things, acts like a, a schoolyard bully. You don't give a schoolyard bully your lunch because then he'll ask for it every day. So, now, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? About what if China start oh, more and more? Yeah, I'm sorry. So, Interesting question. China objected to the term Indo Pacific because it was seen as in Beijing as the anti China part of the game policy. I'm not sure that was necessarily true. Um, remember, the term didn't originate in the US, the term originated in China. Shinzo Abe was the term for Indo Pacific. And what he did in Beijing was what he used to call the, the democracy dynamics bringing together what's now Quad, really bringing India into the region. And that was all good for the U.S. The U.S. had been developing global ties with India consistently since the Clinton administration. One of the few places in, in Asia where U.S. ties had gone consistently up and not been down. Um, so it's understandable why China gets to it. China doesn't want to be able to do it. China does not want another big democracy talking about rules and norms and you know, doing things kind of money. That said, it's pretty universally accepted now. I mean, once ASEAN put out the ASEAN outlook in the Pacific, the game was kind of up, right? So the longer China goes about pretending that the term doesn't exist, the sillier they can enforce it. I don't really think the U.S. cares. I mean, the, I, the concept of the Indo Pacific has served its purpose. It won't change anything about the U.S. Indo Pacific strategy if China starts using the same word. Uh, we have another question. This is from uh, the online audience. Um, this is from Pepe Yanan, University of uh, Al Azhar. Uh, is it the right decision for Indonesia to increase its military capacity for veterans in Natuna? What is the best decision for Indonesia to face China? And I'm not going to put it. Thank you. I do not like giving advice to governments other than my own. My job is to advise the U.S. government on policy. Um, that said, as an academic, the, the reason that the drilling in the Tuna block finished last year on schedule is that the Indonesian Navy and Bakamla sent out patrols in force for four months preventing Chinese Coast Guard vessels from disrupting the rig. If that hadn't happened, Indonesia would have had to end the drilling. And that pressure will increase. So if Indonesia hopes to continue to maintain access to its own waters, it will have to maintain a persistent patrol capability, which it does not currently have. It is stressed the Navy and the Coast Guard to keep up that operation. Indonesia needs more maritime mainland, more maritime patrol, more maritime security. They don't all have to be manned patrol vessels and planes, and that got a pretty innovative way to do this. A lot of this is going to have to be unmanned assets, drones, space-based systems, but in general, Indonesia needs the same thing that everybody else in the region needs. It needs to be able to monitor all of its waters all of the time, document Chinese bad behavior, and deploy Navy and Coast Guard vessels when they're really needed. That still won't 
can't solve this problem. That buys time. That ensures illusion access. The ultimate solutions to the South China Sea dispute are not military. They are all diplomatic economic, imposing costs on Beijing for bad behavior, such that China decides that it's better to compromise than to continue to behave the way it is. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, any more questions from this? Hello, I'm doing uh, Mr. Jack. My name is Marina. I'm also uh, a researcher at the Health Center. Uh, my question is, uh, as you know that uh, ASEAN member states uh, wants to or prefer to settle the this issue with China in uh, multilateral forum, while the while China uh, wants to negotiate bilaterally uh, with each ASEAN member state. Uh, so it hasn't reached common ground yet until now. Uh, so from your uh, from your perspective, uh, how uh, or what is the best way or approach to create a win-win solution about this matter? Thank you. Um, in 2018, I ran a year-long effort uh, with expert working group on the South China Sea that brought together about 25, I think, experts from every claimant country in the region, a mix of international lawyers, marine biologists, and politics from Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, China, Vietnam, and Taiwan, um, and Singapore. We didn't have any crude iron. Uh, and our job, we sat them down, and we said, okay, let's see if we can come up with what a code of conduct would look like that would actually work. A code of conduct that would have to be, we said two rules. It had to be consistent with international law, and it had to be consistent with the domestic law of all the claimants, including China. First, we came up with the fisheries agreement. We, we realized that the only hand We came up with the fisheries agreement. That part was easy. Then we came up with an oil and gas agreement. That part was hard. And then we came up with the everything else chapter, you know, marine science, search and rescue, and, and all of that, with um, dispute settlement mechanisms, bacon. Which told us that all of this is possible. What's lacking is not legal solutions, what's lacking is political will. So part of the answer to that, as I said, is there will have to be a change in China's negotiating position for any of this work. And the only way that's going to happen is either for Xi Jinping to lose power or for enough international pressure to convince China that it should become and probably both need to happen for the record. I don't I don't know that there's a, a solution possible while she's still in power. Um, if that day were to come, what would a successful negotiation look like? Well, one of the very first things we realize in this group is that it is not possible through a lobby. It is unreasonable for us to demand that Laos or Cambodia or Myanmar accept economic coercion and diplomatic pressure from China for things that do not directly affect them. Just like Indonesia does not take part in negotiations in the Mekong River Commission. Just like we don't have the Filipinos to take part in the Malacca Straits Bill. The South China Sea is the only regional security issue in which ASEAN insists that all 10 members have to be there, which has never made any sense to me. Right? The Sula Selva Sea Patrol right now. Has anybody called Myanmar to ask if they'll take part in the Sula Sea Patrol? No, because Myanmar has nothing to do with the Sula Sea. So, the role of the code of conduct should be, as the DOC did, just set general rules. Say, because Avian's invested so much time in that, we can't just let it go. Just say, peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, and Avian endorses further negotiations among just claimants, and then Avian needs to get out of the way. At that point, the negotiation should only involve those directly invested, which means now, on fisheries and on oil and gas, yes, Indonesia has to be there. I don't care if Indonesia wants to keep saying it's not a claimant to the South China Sea. They can say it's not a claimant to the Spratly Islands. But as long as Chinese fishing vessels are showing up off North and all the Tuna Bays are, and as long as Chinese Coast Guard vessels are harassing drilling and tuna blocks, then clearly Indonesia needs to join with Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Brunei 
to negotiate unilateral agreements with China without asking Vietnam or Phnom Penh for permission. Someone talk about it? Any more questions from the audience? Okay, if not, um, if I may, Robert, I have also maybe a follow-up question. Uh, you're talking about China's economic power. Um, as we know, many of the ASEAN countries are very dependent on China's financial protection. And then um, for the last decade or so, we, we saw that Brunei has been like the silent layman among the ASEAN, and, and it's clear to see a, a, a clear division of ASEAN, and they fight ASEAN, they said. Um, on your in your opinion, do you, do you know what what kind of mechanism should ASEAN uh, make or for, for to kind of avoid these things to happen? Because during the negotiation with the, the consensus based, but with a silent payment or with a divided views on, on issues, uh, it will pretty much hamper all the progress that has been made. I, I said that Indonesia and the other countries shouldn't have to ask permission from Cambodia or Laos. I should add, you shouldn't have to ask permission from Brunei. If Brunei doesn't want to be in the room, don't force them. In the book, um, at one point I talked about, I said the 2009 kind of shelf submission. Brunei has also submitted a kind of a shelf submission. Yeah, they submitted a one paragraph preliminary kind of shelf submission that said that Brunei was mapping its shelf and would submit a full claim in one year. And I don't remember what exactly the numbers in the book. I write as of the time of writing, Brunei is 90 some months late. So Brunei is 10 years late on its own self declared deadline to submit a shelf. The last time there was an effort to negotiate mini ladder, which I think is the right model, again, it was 2015. Everybody was so angry that the foreign ministers of Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines met twice to have their own claim of being for the first time ever outside of the outcome of context. Uh, met once in KL and then once up in Manila. Both times they asked for Brunei to come. Once, Brunei just said no. The second time they said they would send an embassy representative to meet with the foreign ministers of three other countries. And even then, nobody showed up. I'm told they even had this name on the tent and didn't end the So anyway, Brunei may not be helpful in the negotiation. But the overall point stands that it is unfair and unrealistic to expect these other claims to wait forever just because all tenants don't want to impose any, don't want to receive any costs from China. If this issue is not moved outside of the object context, I firmly believe it will eventually fracture the organization. Because we are dangerously close to the point where it is impossible for the Indian Filipino to fix, impossible for them to go away gas. And eventually, given how dangerous things are out there, China is going to get money. What's going to happen if we wake up tomorrow and we find out that a Chinese militia vessel ran over a bunch of Vietnamese and killed them? And then the next Austin Prime Minister's meeting, Laos and Cambodia block any reference to them. The Vietnamese are going to storm out of the room and flip the table. So if Osgem can't deal with this issue, it has two options. It can let the issue fracture the organization, or it can move the issue outside of the organization. And the latter is a far better option. Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, um, if there is no other question. Okay, then. If that's... Um, Maybe that would be my last question, and for this discussion, will be the uh, last question. So I think it is finally for us to close this discussion. Uh, may I again uh, raise my gratitude over to everyone who come and attend in person and also on the online platform uh, to spare their time despite their busy schedules. Uh, I really hope that everyone enjoyed this discussion and had a very fruitful discussion, I believe. And I hope that we could have um, another public lecture series or other talking ASEAN um, in the near future. And with that said, I hope everyone is safe and healthy, and I look forward to the uh, future events. Thank you so much.